there was supposed to have been sound with that. I guess one of the most enduring questions that we can ask as a child, and that's a picture of me, that darling little child, when I was five years old. <laughs> and one of the questions, I remember asking this, Mommy, where did I come from? And I grew up in the, uh, a small little mountain town in East Tennessee. We were very strict Southern Baptist. So as you can imagine, the answer I got came right out of Genesis. And the answer was, honey, you were created by God. And I accepted that for a long time. And the human race also accepted that answer for a long time. We didn't question our origins. We got all of our learning from the Bible for many centuries. So no one questioned where we came from until about, as a species, about uh, uh, the mid-1800s, people began asking where we came from. And the answer then became evolution, Darwin. And if anybody's been following the debate in the last couple of years very closely, and I'm, this is not a Bible thumper speaking, I haven't thumped a Bible in many years, uh, there's a, actually an ongoing scientific debate in academic circles as to whether evolution and Darwin has any merit today. Uh, if you see me after this, I can tell you some interesting books and articles to read, but I won't go into it. But I'd like to suggest there, there may be a third explanation about where we as humans came from. Uh, my <clears throat> topic takes us back to the mid-1800s. There was a fellow by the name of Heinrich Schliemann. At that time, there, were no, there was no such thing as archaeologists and anthropologists. It was not a science at, at yet. People did dig up stuff. They'd dig up dinosaur bones and drag them home. Uh, people would dig up uh, pot shards from ancient cultures and not realize what they were. They wouldn't cata catalog them or categorize them. they just put them on their mantelpieces. The formalized study of uh, anthropology, anth anthropology and archaeology didn't come about until after Schliemann. He dug up Troy in uh, Turkey, Anatolia at the time. And his success at finding Troy, which was a mythological city as far as most people are concerned, uh, led other people to create the, the sciences of anthropology and archaeology. It set off uh, a firestorm, people searching all over the ancient world, Rome, Egypt, but most uh, importantly, Mesopotamia, uh, because it had biblical connections. Bring up a map of Mesopotamia. This is in the news right now. This is the area we now know of as Iraq and Iran. If you watched the news last night, you probably heard Iraq and Iran mentioned. Well, this is ancient Mes Mesopotamia. And as archaeologists began digging, uh, they went progressively. They, they found uh, the cities of, of Kish and Nippur, and they were astonished to find these cities that had been referred to in the Bible. The city of Ur, where Abraham supposedly came from in the Hebrew Bible. And what they were, had actually found was the ancient, most ancient civilization of all, ancient Sumer. Sumer grew up about 6,000, it hit its height around 6,000 years ago, 4,000 BC. Uh, they found thousands of these little clay tablets, hundreds of thousands, I should say. They're so common, you can even find them on eBay. I've, I have some authentic clay tablets in my personal collection, paid a couple of hundred dollars for them, and I have a piece of history that goes back 4,000 years. Had this uh, odd little uh, cipher on them that was, came to be known as cuneiform. Uh, they were written with holding a, just a little patty of river clay with a wedge stylus. And they would fire them in a kiln. And these uh, clay tablets were used to, to cover everything. Contracts, uh, marriages, divorces, uh, bills of sales, anything that had to be recorded in a, a civilization were recorded on clay tablets. And they noticed one other thing. When they finally, uh, uh, when Rawlinson finally broke the code and was able to interpret these uh, clay tablets, they found that in many, many of the clay tablets, they referred to gods. And I want to point out little g, not a capital G. Many gods, and they said that they, these gods were present in their lives, that they lived among them. They flew in the skies. They lived in that ziggurat temple up in, on, the, on the hill, and they knew their personalities. And they talked about them as if they were real people. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more. These are, are some more clay tablets. These are what the gods, this is what one of the gods looked like. This is from a uh, Assyrian wall. And I'll quickly go through a couple of other clay tablets. There was no uniform size or shape. 
Let me point out this uh, one on the lower left, uh, the beer allocation tablet. <clears throat> the Sumerians loved their beer. In fact, they invented beer. In fact, the Sumerians, or out of the Sumerian culture, came nearly all of the, the firsts that we regard as uh, uh, necessary for a culture. Another uh, means of communication was a thing called a cylinder seal. If any of you signed a check in the past week, uh, have you ever wondered why just by signing a check that makes it a legal document? Well, that goes back to Sumer also. They were the first people to instigate the use of making a unique mark on a document, in this fact, in this point, a clay document, by rolling a cylinder seal. I'm wearing one. Uh, I have a collection of these things. And uh, if you'd like to see it later, approach me later and I'll show it to you. I have some as old as 4,000 years old. Another cylinder seal. This, these were all unique, of course, so they, it was just like a signature. To sign a document, you'd take this cylinder seal off your neck, roll it in the clay, they would fire it and it became a permanent record. This is a cylinder seal. This one's found in the uh, Berlin People's Museum. We're going to be coming back to this, but I want you to look at two things. This is uh, the god Enki, and uh, he's the seated one with the horns. And you can always tell the, the high-ranking Sumerian gods because they wore horned helmets. And he is presenting to the human, who is last in row there, with the plow. And this is the uh, gift of agriculture. And by the way, uh, all of the advances that the Sumerians had made, they said, we did not develop this. Now, I know human nature, if, if I were to develop something, I would want it to be called the Stanley process. And you probably would too. Uh, but they said, we didn't create all these things. Uh, these were gifts from the gods. And this shows the gift of agriculture from the god Enki. Now, I want you to notice in the uh, upper uh, upper part of that, there's a little uh, depiction of the solar system. We're going to get back to that later. Another thing I want you to notice is if uh, the god in key and that cylinder seal were to stand up, he would tower over the human, uh, the two humans in this depiction. And likewise, in the other cylinder seal, the wall depiction rather, uh, this is a, uh, a priest administering to one of the gods. And you can, tell, you can see if he were to stand up, he would be immense. This is one of the characteristics of the gods. They were very large people. They called them the Anunnaki. And it comes down through uh, later Hebrew. If you look in the Bible, you'll find about 20 references to the Anakim, also the Nephilim. This, go, this goes back to Sumerian times when the Anunnaki were the gods. Here's another cylinder seal drawn, and it shows the plow actually in use. And uh, you notice up in the sky is a little cross-like object. I'm going to cover that a little bit later, too. just want to call your attention to it. One more depiction of uh, one of the gods with a human. This is the head of the uh, stone of the law of Hammurabi. If you've ever heard of that, that is supposedly the first law ever given to man. Well, first, Hammurabi did not write the code. He claims in the, uh, uh, the prologue to the law that the law was given to him by the god who is seated there, Shamash. And again, you can see that if uh, the seated god, and you can tell he's a very high-ranking god because of the number of horns on his headpiece, if he were to stand up, he would tower over the king Hammurabi. This is a different depiction of uh, Shamash. It actually is about 500 years later. And I think you can see a, uh, a definite resemblance. So although uh, the, the two pieces of art are 500 years apart, they still seem to know what he looked like. So that, that indicates to me that just perhaps Shamash was a real person. Here are some pictures of uh, Sumerians in their daily lives. These are, are humans. These are on, on, on this side, upper, is a priest. And on the far side over there is a scribe. The others are, are merchants and people of the middle class. Uh, down below is one of the first uh, family portraits. And I think it, you can probably notice one of the common traits in many, if not most, of the Sumerian statues. I've got one in my collection hands folded like this in, the, in a votive pose, a very devout pose. Now, they're not praying to these gods. We didn't come about the concept of praying as we know it until much later. The word uh, 
prayer actually goes back to a Hebrew word, avad, which goes back to the Sumerian word, avad, which means work for. These Sumerians did not pray or worship their gods. They worked for them. This is King Gudea. And it's, uh, these are different depictions of him throughout his life. He had a nice long reign, and he, was, uh, he built the ziggurat at, at Ur. It's still standing today. It's being guarded by American troops. And uh, again, you see the votive pose, as if to say, I work for my God. Sumer blossomed about 4,000 BC. It was at its height. And many of the firsts that uh, we know of as human culture came directly from Sumer. Metallurgy, they had the first written language, the first written music, the first doctors, and believe it or not, the first lawyers. They had a bicameral congress, we, we, like we have a senate and a, and a house. They had a bicameral congress too. They had navigation, did I say metallurgy, mathematics, uh, astronomy, I'm gonna get back to that. Many of the firsts, uh, came from Sumer. And the surprising, astonishing thing about Sumer is these things came about rather suddenly. Now when I say suddenly, I'm talking about a couple of thousand years, but uh, in terms of human development, that's very sudden. Uh, here, oh, by the way, this is a, uh, Sumer was the first to have a standing army. Uh, I was in the Marine Corps, and I know from that experience that uh, any kind of military is a huge organizational endeavor with training and supplies and logistics and, and all that goes with it. Well, Sumer had uh, ample people and resources to have a full-time professional standing army. And here's one depiction of them. Now, all this stuff came about very suddenly in Sumer. And uh, by way of comparison, I want to show you uh, something else in the hominid line. This is pre-human. From the Australopithecines in Africa to the Neanderthal, the image you see on the left is an Australopithecine stone scraping tool. And it took two million years to get from that tool to the tool over on the left. And archaeologists will tell you that this is an improvement because there are, it's more hand-sized, many more chips are taken out of it, it's a more refined object. To me, they both look like stones, but I've had archaeologists and anthropologists tell me, no, this is a much improved model. So if I were to illustrate the two million years it took to go from one stone to the improved model, then compare that, I'm going to pull in, right, running across the screen there, I don't know if you can see that or not, can you see that little dot? That's 7,600 years, and that's the time it took Sumer to go for, Sumerians to go from living in little caves and uh, mud dwellings to the full-blown civilization that they had with all those first we talked about. And keep in mind, they said, we did not develop this. These were gifts from the gods. In 11,000 BC, this was at the end of the last ice age. And geologists tell us that the ice age ended rather suddenly, abruptly. Humans were living just like this. You've seen the cave paintings in Lascaux, France, and uh, this is from uh, the tents. Uh, those are from a dig in the Ukraine. This is how the hominids lived for the most part. There were a few who didn't. They lived serving, working for these gods. But the excess population, the most of humans, the, the rest of them, us, lived out under rather extreme conditions. After the Ice Age, uh, had ended abruptly, suddenly, uh, within 3,600 years, and that's a, uh, that's a figure to keep in mind, 3,600 years, we were living in communes, making pottery, doing little uh, agriculture, and then 3,600 years, for a total of 7,200 years, we were living in cities with multi-storied buildings, fine art, music, written language, and uh, all that goes with it. Uh, and by the way, at the end of the, that, that ice age, uh, there's many tales. You've probably read about it when you were a child in, in the Bible, the, the flood. Well, the Sumerians said all that, that, we, that triggered this was the great flood. In fact, every culture in, on earth has a story about a prehistoric flood. In North America alone, there are 47 different uh, tales among the native Indian, uh, American Indians. So everywhere you go, from South America to China to Europe and to Africa, 
There are stories of a, a flood in prehistoric times, and that's what that's referring to. And another thing they found was that in, in translating these uh, Sumerian tablets, they were shocked to find that many of the stories that the people of the 1850s had grown up with, like I grew up with, that they had studied in Genesis, were also in the Sumerian tablets 2,000 years earlier, 3,000 years earlier. The flood, the dispersion of humans, the Tower of Babel, and all that. A man named uh, George Smith, I'm sorry, yes, George Smith, wrote a book in 1876 called The Chaldean Account of Genesis. Chaldean, just another word for Babylonians or Sumerians. And it shocked the, uh, the Christian world because he proved that the interpretation of, of the uh, creation documents from uh, ancient Sumer were an exact mirror only 2,000 years earlier of the early accounts of Genesis. And um, this is uh, the early Hebrew writings. Well, there is a Sumerian and Hebrew connection. And uh, there were seven tablets. The, the creation story in Sumer was called the Enuma Elish. That means when in the heights. That's the first line. And it tells the story of how humans came about, how the, our solar system came about, how the earth came about. And it's really a very compelling and cohesive story. There were seven tablets of the Enuma Elish. And you can see these in museums, copies, because there are many copies of them. And as we know, there are seven days of creation. In the Enuma Elish, the gods, a little g and plural, created humans. And if you are familiar with the Hebrew version, not the King James version, but if you look at the Hebrew original version of the, of the two accounts of creation, and there are two, if you read Genesis, there are two different versions of creation. And in the Hebrew version, it says, the Elohim, the gods, created man. The first uh, men in uh, the Sumerian account were called the Adapa or the Adamu, means earthling. Adamu later on became Adam in the Hebrew account. There was a garden of Eden in the, uh, talked about in these tablets. It was an orchard. It was also a, apparently a genetic research station run by the Anunnaki, the gods. And that filtered down to the later Hebrews as the Garden of Eden. The, one of the chief gods, Enki, uh, that means uh, com earth commander. Uh, his name was also Ea, means whose home is water. And he's depicted, not because he was an evil person, but he was depicted as a serpent because he was a very wise person. In Sumerian culture, the, the serpent is extremely wise. So in keys, often depicted as a serpent. I'm going to show you some stillness seals. And of course, we all know the story of the evil serpent in the garden who, who tempted Eve. There's a story in, an, in another document of a Cain who killed his brother and was banished. And we all don't know that as the much later Hebrew story is Cain and Abel. Uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, preceded the Hebrew Bible by about 2,000 years, the hero, Ziosudra, was told by Enki to go build a boat because there was going to be a big flood. And, of course, we know the story of uh, Noah much later. Uh, that's a Hebrewized word, uh, name, uh, told to build a, a, uh, a boat, an ark. In the ver Sumerian version, the flood lasted for six days, and it, the uh, ark was that uh, Ziosudra built was washed up on the mountain Ararat. And in the Hebrew version, the, the flood lasted for 40 days and the ark washed up on Ararat. I think 40 days was chosen because 40 has a mystical import to, to the Hebrews. Uh, likewise, six has had a mystical import to the Sumerians. Uh, the story of grain and cattle uh, is, is a big story in Sumerian culture and also in, if you look in the second uh, story of creation in the in Genesis. It tells of the story of the, the creation of, he, of grain and cattle. Uh, mankind spread over the earth. Two different versions. Ta the uh, Tower of Babel in the Hebrew version and the earlier version. Mankind was just spread across the earth because we there were too many of us. <coughs> we uh, once we were created, we tended to outstrip our our. Uh, we were very prolific, shall I say. And uh, the, the, uh, 
in the uh, Enuma Elish and in the Atrahasis and other accounts that there are some rebellious cities that had to be destroyed by one of the gods. And that came down to us in the Hebrew version as the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I could go on, but I've run out of room. Uh, there are many other parallels. King Sargon, for example, of Sumer, was uh, born in secrecy, and his mother hit him, uh, put him in a, uh, a basket and of uh, bulrushes and set him adrift. It's the story of Moses, on and on and on. I'll, I'll not beg the, uh, belabor that anymore. You get the point. The Hebrew... Bible, the Genesis account of creation that we know, came directly from Sumeria. And what we have is a shortened and edited version. If you want the longer version, go to the Enuma Elish. And what is the connection? Well, Sumer and uh, Israel, where the Hebrews were, are very close geographically. It's, it's a very short hop from um, Babylon to uh, Israel, and as we all know, it, maybe you do, uh, the, Israelis, uh, uh, the Israelites were taken into captivity in the 6th century BC, and that's how they were exposed to those stories. Before the Hebrew Bible came about, they were exposed to them in Babylon. They wrote them down, put their own version, their own spin on it, and that's why we have the Hebrew Bible and uh, subsequently the King James Version today. It's the Enuma Elish. <clears throat> Well, one of the astonishing things about Sumer and among the, all, all the other first was they had a very well-developed astronomy and cosmogony, an explanation of how the solar system came about. Uh, according to the Enuma Elish, uh, it told of a, an intruder planet that wandered into our solar system, collided with another planet existing. It was called Tiamat. It was between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. It cleaved the, the planet in half and shunted the surviving half into a new orbit. It became the third rock from the sun. Now, if you look at uh, the way we know our solar system today, we have the sun and the, uh, the planets. <clears throat> well, the Sumerians had a, a typical, I mean, had, had a similar uh, way of looking at the solar system. I'm going to zoom in on this. Can everybody see those? If you count the sun at the middle, there are 11 other planets around it. Now, they counted our moon as one of the planets, so that's why uh, the, the count, uh, stick with me on this. You count the sun and the known planets and the moon, you come up with 11 points. And in the color version, in the upper right-hand corner, uh, is something, it's, it's a twelfth planet. They claimed that this twelfth planet, and that's, don't forget, including the sun and the moon, is a part of our solar system. They call it Nibiru. That's the home of the Anunnaki. That's where they said the Anunnaki came from, was Nibiru. This brings us to Zechariah Sitchin. Over a personal uh, event that happened in Zechariah's life, uh, he spent a lifetime looking for who the Nephilim were. Zechariah was born in Russia, but he grew up in uh, Palestine before it was Israel. And uh, he set off on a life mission to discover who the Nephilim were. Uh, he went to college at, at the uh, London University, studied economics and history, and uh, became a, a very good Orientalist, a historian and uh, a linguist. He's one of 200 people in the world who can actually read those cuneiform uh, texts in the Sumerians uh, created. And in 1970, well, before I touch on that, the Nephilim, if you take that word apart, the Hebrew, Nephil means to come down, to descend. And if you add the plural ending, Chim, you get those who came down. And the Hebrew version, Nephilim, means those who came down. Well, came down from where? Uh, as, a, as a similar model, the word for God in Hebrew is El. And there's also a poetic version up there, uh, Eloah. You find that in Proverbs. But those are singular. But whenever you see in the Hebrew book, Elohim is referring to plural, gods. In a like, uh, similar fashion, the word Nephilim, and we're reading from right to left. That's how Hebrew is written. You see the, uh, the same suffix for Elohim and Nephilim. He determined finally that uh, he traced the 
usage of the word Nephilim back to the original source, the, to the Sumerian documents, and they were talking about the Anunnaki. Those were the gods that, that Zechariah Sitchin finally found. And after 20 or 30 years of muttering to himself and studying the, this uh, topic, his wife, bless her heart, finally said, quit talking about it, write it down. So in 1976, he wrote the book, The Twelfth Planet. It's been almost 30 years ago. That book came out. You can still go into any large size bookstore and find that on the shelf. That's quite an accomplishment for a book to stay on the shelf in print for 30 years. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend it to you. Um, Zechariah speaks many languages and uh, a very uh, erudite and scholarly man. The, the Twelfth Planet might be a challenging book for some people because it is rather scholarly. In this picture, uh, Zechariah is talking to Monsignor Balducci, who is a theologian with the Vatican. And Monsignor Balducci says, there is definitely something to Zechariah's thesis. So if the Vatican is saying that, who am I to doubt it? And I just want to throw a couple of pictures in of me and Zechariah. I've met him several times, very engaging, very interesting person. Now the uh, Sumerians uh, wrote the seven tablets of creation called the Enuma Elish, and they talked about this intruder planet Nibiru. And uh, it was captured into, our, into orbit around our sun and took on an orbit of 3,600 years, a very elliptical course. Uh, why should we believe the Enuma Elish? Well, for many years, for example, we thought that Neptune and uh, Uranus were gaseous giant planets. It was just a good assumption to make. But the Enuma Elish said, au contraire, Neptune and uh, uh, Uranus are watery twins. And astronomers poo-pooed that until Voyager 1 did a flyby and sent back pictures. And they said, my goodness, they're watery twins. The early universe uh, was quite a chaotic place, much more so than today. Following the Big Bang, objects of uh, different sizes from galaxies down to pebble size were going flying off in, in many directions. So uh, in some degree, the universe is still a chaotic place. <clears throat> and here's how Zechariah Sitchin interprets the Enuma Elish, the creation story of our solar system. Uh, I've drawn this out. I, I omitted the outer planets, just the inner planets, so please forgive my, my artisan attempts here. This is what the inner planets would have looked like. You had Mercury, Venus, then the third planet at that time, this is about four and a half billion years ago, by the way. You'd have Mars, and then you'd have Tiamat, the, the, the fourth planet, and then Jupiter, and then all the other planets on out. And their orbits weren't quite stable at that time. And according to the Enuma Elish, into this mix came a planet and its own, its own satellites, its own moons. And as it approached, and it actually made several passes through the, the inner solar system. And on one of its passes, one of its moons struck Tiamat, cleaving it in half. One half was shoved into a new orbit, inside the orbit of Mars, making now this new surviving piece of rock, the, the third rock from the sun. And what was left over, the pulverized part, became what we know today as the asteroid system. And uh, also many of the objects, near-Earth objects that still, the, the comets and the meteors that still fly through every once in a while. Over a period of several million years, that, uh, that rock in the third position eventually cooled down. The heat transfer must have been enormous. So that would have created a great deal of heat uh, to be cleaved in half. But the, the half cooled down, began resuming a, a spherical shape yet again, and it became us. We're living on half of a planet right now. We are living on the surviving part of Tiamat. This is what the, if you're looking overhead, looking down on our solar system, our solar system, this is what it would look like. All the planets going around the sun in a counterclockwise fashion. And this is what the orbit of, of Nibiru, who's now a part of our uh, solar system, the 12th planet, would look like. It comes in every 3,600 years and goes back out. It comes back in every 3,600 years and goes back out. Life sprung up on Nibiru before it did on Earth. And uh, 
the, the inhabitants of Nibiru, the Anunnaki that the Bible spoke of as, as the Nephilim, came here to exploit our mineral resources. Nibiru's orbit would look something like this. Coming into the inner solar system every 3,600 years and then going back out not to be heard of again for yet another 3,600 years. And it's at this point, I think, and Zechariah thinks, and many other writers think, that every time the planet comes in, the Anunnaki come over here, check us out, pick up some more minerals, and uh, lately have been imparting to us technology like the plow and other things, maybe doing some genetic upgrades, and then going back on their merry way. They don't want to stay here because this is a tough duty station for them. This is a hostile place for them to live. Sometimes it's a hostile place for us to live. They call the uh, planet Nibiru throughout human cultures all over the world, it's called the planet of crossing because it comes through, it crosses through our sky, crosses the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, it revisits the asteroid belt where it, it first uh, struck the planet Tiamat before going back out. It never comes near Earth. It's not a, uh, not a physical threat to Earth. But the uh, cross symbol predates Christianity by many thousands of years. Here are several of them. Uh, the upper right is an Egyptian cross or a drawing of one. The two in the lower left, those are pre-Columbian in South America. And over here, if I get my pointer to work, maybe you can see it from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, there are two crosses uh, in, in that depiction. I can't seem to point it. Perhaps you can, I can't see where it's falling. Anyway, I, I trust that you can see those two crosses in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And here's yet another Sumerian cylinder seal with uh, what looks like a Maltese cross on it. Well, uh, people for years looked at uh, Zechariah Sitchin's 12th planet and said, uh, you can't have uh, planets that uh, have that wild of an orbit, uh, that eccentric of an orbit, it just probably wouldn't happen. Well, just recently, in 2003, the French science magazine Science et Vie, Science and Life, a French astronomer said, uh, yes, there probably is another planet in our solar system, and it probably has a very elliptical path, just like this. Science is beginning to catch up to this idea. And in fact, uh, I, I noticed on space.com, the website, uh, I don't know if you can read that or not, but it, there was an article that said that in fact, many, many orbits, many planets have eccentric orbits, wildly eccentric orbits. So it's not so unusual. Uh, I think Zechariah is truly on to something. Uh, now this is a um, depiction of a cylinder seal. For some reason, the Sumerians gave Mars the number six, and Earth was depicted as number seven for some reason. And you see in the right hand, there's the, uh, a god probably in key on Earth. And you count the seven dots, and there's the moon. And he's communicating, saying hello to someone on Mars. And I know it's Mars because there's a little object that has six points on it. And they're probably using what looks like some communication satellite uh, to, to say hello. And for years, Sumerian uh, scholars didn't know why Mars was depicted with the number six and why Earth was depicted as the number seven. We think of ourselves as the third rock from the sun, so we'd be number three, and Mars would be number four. And in fact, there's another cylinder seal below there showing uh, uh, Earth and Mars. Well, it took Zechariah to figure out that if you're coming into our solar system from the outside, if you count from Pluto to Uranus and Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter, the sixth planet you hit, you come to, is Mars. And then the seventh planet you come to is Earth. So that's why Earth is depicted as seven and Mars is six. Interesting, huh? Now the Sumerians told us that these gods were real flesh and blood people. They had warts and all. They were sometimes nasty people. They were sometimes beings. They were sometimes uh, uh, had altruism. They had good traits. They had bad traits. And uh, that they were living among them. Uh, in fact, in every city, there was a sacred precinct with its own ziggurat, and that's where the local god lived. And uh, all the people around uh, they had one job. They worked for that god. 
They worked in the fields, they worked in the stables, they worked in, at Goldsmith. All the work they did was for the God that, that they served. They say these gods had an advanced technology. Now the Sumerians, being uh, just recently literate, and not having this technology, by the way, the humans did not have this technology of, of flying and uh, communicating uh, long distances and radar and going into space and, and all that. They wrote them down on these clay tablets to the best of their ability. Um, the gods are often depicted as eagles, too. Now, this is not really unusual. We, we do the same thing. Uh, when the moon... Uh, when Neil Armstrong sat down on the moon, he said, Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. And if you flew here, like I did, the pilot on my jet had uh, wings. And all this does is say, we fly. And similarly, uh, those priests who served in Ki, in Ki is associated with water, they're shown as fish. That's uh, one of the priests in the middle there with the, the fish headdress. That means he's a, uh, a priest who serves the god in key. And uh, we, our submariners on their uniforms, they show dolphins and fish. So not much different from what we do. The motif of flying is very common throughout the, the Sumerian uh, culture when they refer to the gods. They were a flying culture. And they, and they never say that the gods themselves could lift up uh, bodily and fly. They said they used machines. Uh, a black flying bird is sometimes described as uh, 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 something that's very stealthy and very fast, something very noisy. Sounds like uh, a jet or a rocket. Um, you've probably seen this. It's from the uh, New Kingdom Temple. It's just south of Cairo. And... Uh, I've heard different explanations of this, trying to debunk this, but I, I, every time I look at it, I still think, no, I'm looking at helicopters and flying craft. That's 3,000 years old. This is a cylinder seal from ancient Mesopotamia uh, of a uh, war party setting off to war, and up in the sky is a rocket. Now, these are two Sumerian characters, Din Gir, and that means the, the righteous ones of the rocket ship. At least that's the way Zechariah Sitchin uh, interprets that. Scholars will say, no, 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 no. But uh, Zechariah insists that uh, Din Gear means the righteous ones of the rocket ship. Because it's always seen in context or association with a god who is going to or fro, coming somewhere or going somewhere. And it's not a, a leap of uh, intuition to, to see that it resembles one of our early rocket ships with a, uh, with a uh, capsule on it. Here's another depiction. This is from an ancient Egyptian wall. This shows a subterranean, what appears to be a, uh, a launcher and a nose cone capsule above ground. And it's being held as an object of, of reverence. According to the Enuma Elish, the gods arrived here about 445,000 years ago. And they came here, uh, oh, by the way, 3,600 years. I told you that would be important. That's a, a period that the Sumerians called one shar. Now, uh, why would preliterate people need to have a uh, period of time that uh, is defined as 3,600 years? Well, the reason is that's the orbit of, uh, one orbit of Nibiru. And they referred to shars as 3,600 years. It's in the Sumerian language. So the Anunnaki came here 120 shars, or 445,000 years ago. They were looking for minerals. Um, apparently their own planet was mineral poor, and they discovered that Earth is very rich in mineral deposits, especially gold. They didn't use gold for commercial purposes. They used it for electronics. They used it for, uh, uh, to plate their windows, just like we do. The Challenger is a, a shuttle. Is, the windows are plated in gold. It keeps, it retains heat. and. Uh, some of the better windows in sky rises are, are plated in a very thin layer of gold. The Anunnaki had the very same purposes. There's some speculation, too, that they were trying to uh, preserve their atmosphere, that repeated trips through the uh, inner solar system was depleting their atmosphere, and they were going, uh, that they planned to suspend gold in very fine particle in a mist 
in their atmosphere in order to protect it. That's one theory. <clears throat> when they first came here, they landed somewhere in the Persian Gulf. That's why they're so uh, associated with uh, Babylon, just because that's where they first splashed down. And they created a, a, a colony in, in the marshy areas. And they called it Eridu, means home in the far away. And their first homes were probably something like this. These are what, this is what people living in those marshy areas today are living like. And uh, uh, the Anunnaki probably lived just like that. They were a technologically advanced culture. Uh, they, at that time, were at a point in their technology that's probably about 100 years from where we are today. I'd say we're beginning to close the gap on them. Whoops, sorry. They apparently use some kind of uh, storage device, a computer device. Uh, it's referred to frequently as a meh, spelled M-E, a meh. They tried to steal them from one another. Uh, um, they were very highly prized, like I prized my laptop here. They had the extreme longevity, living in thousands of years. The early Sumerian king list list uh, Anunnaki rulers who ruled thousands of years. Uh, I think the reason for that is they probably uh, had finally managed to get a hold of their own genetic code and had, uh, had fixed the, the problem of aging. I personally see aging as a uh, medical problem, as a, maybe even a disease. I'd love to, for us to, to uh, advance our genetics to the point where we can live to two and three hundred years. I think that's going to happen very soon. The Anunnaki were ahead of us. Uh, and had, I think they had done that and had adjusted their own genetics and had uh, achieved very long lives. And this led to the myth that they were uh, immortal. They didn't die. Well, they did die. Uh, they did age. Uh, there are various depictions of some of the, the gods as aging and uh, stories of them dying, even murdering one another over jealousies. So uh, they were, uh, they could die. The, their first plan was to obtain the gold from the uh, Persian Gulf waters, but that didn't work out. So they found that there were the, the huge earth deposits of gold in what was called Absu, the, uh, means the lower world. Now, from Sumer, to the lower world, southern Africa, is a, a southerly direction. And this implies to me that uh, someone had an idea of global spatial concept. They also called what we call the Mediterranean Sea, they called it the Upper Sea. And you don't know that it's the Upper Sea unless you can depict or picture in your mind the, the globe as a, uh, as a sphere oriented North Pole, South Pole. So the Mediterranean Sea was the upper sea and uh, Southern Africa was the lower world. <clears throat> they set about um, mining this gold in, in Southern Africa and they worked there for many thousands of years. And they would transship the gold shipments to first to Mars and then to Nibiru every time it came through. Now, I mentioned Mars, let me uh, uh, throw up some real quick pictures. Everybody here should be familiar with the uh, plane at Sidona and some of these odd pictures that have been taken. We don't know what some of these are. Uh, this is something, if you go in the uh, oh, ha um, namescapes, the Hoagland, thank you, Hoagland's website, uh, this is referred to as the, the fortress. Uh, straight objects and things with angles don't occur in nature. These appear to be artificially manufactured something. And that's huge, <clears throat> whatever that is. And here's an anomaly found in one of the craters in Mars. Something has happened on Mars in ancient times. We're just not sure what. But I suspect that whatever it is, we will find it was connected with the uh, activities of the Anunnaki. Anyway, back to our story. Down in the mines, uh, the lower echelon ranks of the Anunnaki had worked there for many thousands of years and they were frankly just quite tired of it. Mining, even as safe as we've made it today, is still uh, hot, brutal, dangerous work. So they mutinied. They said, no more. We don't want to do this anymore. And uh, put the whole mission in jeopardy until the god Enki stepped up and said, I have a solution. The being exists on this planet. I can impose the genetic imprint of the gods, us, the Anunnaki, 
and create us a worker. They were looking for a worker that would be obedient, would follow orders, could handle tools, had a grasp of the, of the human hand. And uh, what they got, I suggest to you, was us. The Hebrew Bible says, and Elohim said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And for, don't forget that comes from the earlier Sumerian Enuma Elish, which says, the creature exists, bind upon it the image of the gods. Well, Enki and his half-sister, Ninti, also known as Ninherzog, set about the task, and probably it took them several hundred years to do. Uh, in the biblical version, it, we think of it happening overnight or in seven days. It probably actually took several hundred years to do. But uh, and it had a, f a few false starts, too. The story, full story is interesting. Read the Twelfth Planet if you want to know about it. And the creature I think that they used, since we are, seem to be the most closely associated with this creature, was Homo erectus. And from Homo erectus, Homo erectus using genetic manipulation, this is about 250,000 years ago, created us. Now, Newsweek did a story sometime back on the, the human genome search, the mapping. And apparently, they were in the search for Adam and Eve. They, they somehow thought that uh, Adam looked like Lionel Richie, but uh, that's, that's, how, that's, that's how their cover is depicted. But this is a more important uh, depiction. This is a cylinder seal about 4,000 years old. It's a drawing of a cylinder seal, uh, to be more precise. And here you see Ninherzog, that's Enki's half-sister, in her laboratory, this is the moment of creation. This is the creation of us. That's Adam, the Adamu, the earthling, sitting on her lap. Behind her is the tree of life, the meaning that she had the power of uh, manipulating genetics. And she's in her laboratory. You see helpers there and the various flasks. This is the story of our creation. So where did we come from? Mommy, where did we come from? According to the Sumerian account, we were created 250,000 years ago by the Anunnaki. And if you look at the Hebrew account, it says God created us in his own image. And according to the um, recent genome mapping that, that took place, and we know the whole picture of the 30,000 odd genes of the human race, I think what happened was that the gods interceded using genetic manipulation on a primate that existed here to create, create us. Now, this is normally where I'd take a break, but we're not going to do that. We're going to press on. <clears throat> you might say, Bill, those are pretty uh, astounding claims. Do you have any proof of that? No, I can't give you proof, proof that would stand up in court. Uh, actually, some of this might stand up in court, but I can show you evidence, and I'm going to go through a little bit of evidence here. Some of it's circumstantial and some pretty compelling, I think. The first, Exhibit A, present, pretend you're a jury. Exhibit A is you, humanity itself. This is our timeline. Do you remember the two million year old, the, the, the two cutting tools it took to take two million years? Remember that? If we had continued on that path of evolution, it would have taken us probably five million years to get to the point where we could uh, have some kind of civilization. And to reach the machine age and the space age would take probably another five million years, a total of 10 million years. But something happened to us right around 200,000 years ago that has put us on a very accelerated path to, uh, to, uh, to civilization. So instead of hunting our food, uh, we now go to Kroger or the Bilo. Uh, we call Pizza Hut to deliver. Um, all, the, all the accoutrements of, of civilization have come about in a twinkling of an eye. And that's because I think we were put on a path about 200,000 years ago, and especially more quickly, uh, more recently, 11,000 years ago on the path to civilization, the gifts of the gods that put us on the road we're on. So we're Exhibit A. We have no right to be here. Exhibit B is this... I'm still on Exhibit A, sorry. Uh, from the Wright brothers who went to Kitty Hawk and flew the plane 
to uh, uh, Charles Lindbergh, who flew across the Atlantic, a mere 24 years elapsed. And 42 years later, we put foot on the moon. A total of 66 years from, from Kitty Hawk to sitting on the moon. That's, that is an incredible story if you stop and think about it. Exhibit B. <clears throat> this is Exhibit B, and I uh, want to acknowledge a, a debt of gratitude to Lloyd Pye on all this genetic stuff. <clears throat> Lloyd, by the way, is the one in the upper right-hand corner. <laughs> Are you out there, Lloyd? <laughs> According to Lloyd and other writing uh, I've, I've pursued, we're not really a primate. The, we have so many differences between us and the primates. Uh, bone density, just, I could go on all day about uh, anatomical differences, but I won't. We have uh, entirely different skulls, bone density, muscle structure. We have eyes that are uh, more rectangular in shape, eye sockets, and we're adapted to looking at visual in, in the daytime. That's why we have to have night vision equipment to assist our uh, nocturnal uh, vision. The primates can see very well at night. Uh, we walk upright most of the time. Uh, uh, the primates rarely walk upright unless they're trying to reach something. And if we were supposedly evolved on this planet, we were very poorly adapted. Show of hands, who's had a sunburn in the last year or two? We are not very well adapted living on this planet. And our hands. Primate hands are designed for crushing and for grasping, gross motion. Human hands are designed for fine things like playing the violin, a keyboard, uh, driving. Uh, there's a huge distance between primate hands, primate anatomy, primate philology, everything, and, and humans. And the thing is, we appeared way too suddenly in the fossil record for any kind of uh, evolution to have taken place. Does size really matter? <clears throat> In terms of brain power, it does. And more, uh, more importantly than size are the convolutions of the brain. Now, here's a, I don't know if you can see that or not, here's a, a postcard next to a mouse and a little uh, a small marmoset monkey. If you took a marmoset monkey's brain and all the convolutions and spread it out, it would cover that postcard. The mouse mouse's brain would cover the postage stamp. A chimpanzee, or in this case, Homo erectus, if you did the same thing, we can extrapolate this from fossil finds, spread out the, the brain and smooth out all the convolutions, would cover about one page, about that size right there. But suddenly, in the fossil record, humans appear 250,000 years ago with no precedence, we're just there, and our brain would cover four pages. And we appeared too suddenly to have, uh, to have evolved here. Something happened. We are a special case of evolution. But I can talk about that stuff all day and not convince you. The real story about the difference between us and the primates is told in the genes. All of the primates have 48 sets of chromosomes. Humans alone have 46. You don't lose two chromosomes and come out better, and not just slightly better, I'm talking about vastly better. Well, the story is told right there in the second and third chromosome. We didn't lose anything. In the human chromosome, in the human genome, the second chromosome is the second and third primate chromosome that have been fused. And that's a process that doesn't occur in nature. That's a process that occurs in the laboratory. That right there is the smoking gun. And also geneticists have pointed out that in doing the human genome mapping, they came across 223, they call them, haha, -ha, alien genes. I think they're right, more right than, the, than they know. And another thing about humans, Darwin himself said that uh, we have all the earmarks of a domesticated animal because of the great number of genetic defects that we have. Uh, Animals occurring in nature have very few genetic defects. Does anybody care to guess how many defects humans have? I heard 1,000. Do I hear 2,000? Do I hear 4? 4,000? 
We have over 4,000 genetic defects, and we're finding a new one or two every year. Anytime that you mess with something genetically, you introduce inadvertently genetic defects. I think we have that many genetic defects because we have been messed with genetically. Dolly the sheep, uh, the first cloned sheep, died at the University of Tennessee uh, because uh, it had a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't University of Tennessee. We've been cloning cattle at University of Tennessee. But Dolly died because she had a compromised immune system uh, inherited genetically. We don't have it just right yet. The Anunnaki didn't have it right either. Uh, I'd say many of the people in this room, myself included, have some kind of genetic defect. And I'm a little angry about it, to tell you the truth. <clears throat> Exhibit C, geology. We are familiar with uh, Pangaea or Gondwana land. Geologists say at one time all the land masses were on one side of the planet. Well, the planets don't form that way. Planets form homogeneously. Why would we have the land mass on one side of the, of the planet and only gradually would they move through tectonic motion into their current location. I think it's because our planet was struck, cut in half, and uh, the remaining, the surviving land masses then were shifted into their current location. This is a, a depiction of the Earth. Has anybody flown over the Atlantic? You know, it's a, a long flight. It's a really long flight. You can catch two movies and a nap and a meal and set down jet lagged in London. Well, let me rotate that. If you've ever flown across the Pacific, you have a much longer trip, a much longer trip. Um, what you're looking at there is the evidence of a scene of a crime. This is where Nibiru, or rather one of its satellites, struck Tiamat. And this is, this is today. This is even after millions of years of tectonic movement, we're still have that much of the Pacific Ocean. And if you do core samples anywhere on Earth, you're going to come up with roughly 4 billion years. That's the age of the Earth. The only exception is the Pacific Ocean. You dig down, go down far enough and do a core sample, and you come up with a mere 200 million years. It's much newer crust. It's just taken that long for the crust to form at the Pacific. You're looking at half of a planet. We live on half a planet. I've already talked about uh, the documentary evidence, uh, Exhibit D. I don't need to go into it, except to say that we e can either accept the documentary evidence of the Sumerians and the, the Hebrews and the Egyptians and, and others who wrote during this time about these gods and their advanced development, we can accept that as historical eyewitness accounts, or we can say that our ancestors were hallucinating. I choose to think that they were writing down in their own limited way, I think they were talking about uh, real events that they, that they saw. Exhibit E, the world is literally littered with the remnants of the Anunnaki, of a previous uh, civilization. Now, I know Michael Cremo, who's going to follow me, will talk about previous civilizations. Um, but I think much of the remnants that, that survive today are left over from the Anunnaki period. The great uh, pyramid and sphinx at Giza. We could not build that today if we tried. Uh, here are a couple of more pyramids. We know exactly who built those. Uh, they're falling apart. They uh, couldn't, in the bent pyramid there, they couldn't sustain the 52 degree angle. And so they then went to a, a lesser do, uh, angle. And the red pyramid in the background, if you can see it or not, is just a pile of a rubble, a pile of bricks. The one that has remained, the three rather that have remained, are the three at, at Giza. And they, I think, were built uh, about 10,000 years ago by the Anunnaki. And uh, and so were the Sphinx. In fact, the recent evidence, if you are familiar with the writings of uh, Professor Schock and West, said, yes, indeed, these were built around 10,500 years ago. If they were, then they were built by the Anunnaki. Uh, I won't go into this in great detail, but this is a, a, a palette that shows in the upper right-hand corner the, that the pyramid already existed in the time of Menes. That predates uh, Khufu by about 1,000 years. So Sometimes the Great Pyramid is attributed to Khufu. He could not have built that. It didn't happen. And by the way, these pyramids were never the tomb of anybody. Uh, here's another little artifact in the museum. I took this picture in the British Museum. It's a Sumerian uh, uh, object. And it tells the story of Enki coming, uh, or rather, I'm sorry, Enlil, another god, coming to Earth and how he got here. 
People don't just make this stuff up unless there's something to base it on. And I think the Sumerians who created this based it on the story told to them by Enlil. Exhibit F, I call this uh, uh, technological parity. <clears throat> when these tablets were first uh, interpreted in the 1850s, they were immediately put down as myth. These things could not happen because people couldn't fly. I flew here, by the way, as some of you did. But back in the 1850s, people couldn't fly, and they certainly couldn't go into space or do genetic uh, 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 research and create new species. Uh, they couldn't uh, communicate over long distance. And I communicate over long distance all the time. Most of you do. I've got a cell phone. Big deal. Most of us do. But to the Sumerians, that was a, was a big deal. These gods were able to communicate over great distances. They had weapons that could destroy single cities with one weapon. And they were able to go probe other planets and go places. Well, we have reached that point. I suspect if we found these clay tablets today, we would say, oh, this is indeed a previously unknown advanced civilization. But because these clay tablets were discovered by men of the 1850s, they couldn't possibly be, uh, be true, so they were put down as myth, and they've remained uh, thought of as myth until this very day. Uh, I won't go into a whole bunch of these. This is the, the famous Piri Reyes map in a, a Turkish museum. It shows the uh, Antarctica region with all of its rivers and uh, inlets uh, portrayed. Uh, Piri Reyes was an admiral, and he said he copied this map from older maps, which came from older maps. Nobody knows how far back those maps go, but the only problem is the Antarctic has been under about two miles of ice for the last 6,000, 4,000 years. So there's no way he could have drawn this map. Who drew the original map? They think it may have come from the Anunnaki times, and also you had to be able to view it from the air to have drawn those maps. Anyway, the... Uh, the, the world of, uh, of our, our museums, uh, everybody, every museum has some kind of uh, thing stuck in a drawer someplace that just doesn't fit the current paradigm. Exhibit H, astronomical uh, uh, exhibits. Uh, they, the Sumerians had a very good depiction of how our solar system came about. It would stand up under scrutiny today. We've already talked about that. Exhibit I. Agriculture. Now, uh, we are told, we were led to believe that agriculture came about from uh, early farmers and Neolithic hunter gatherers taking these seeds and domesticating them into the basic crops we know today wheat, emer, oats, barley, rice, corn, and so on. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that did not happen and could not have happened. Some of the fossilized seeds that we know of are about the size of a flea or a grain of salt. Now, you're going to tell me that some farmer who is struggling for an existence picks up this little tiny thing that's inedible, has to be changed at the molecular level, has to have more chromosomes added, has to be softened, and has to do it over several generations. So he tells his son, this will not put food on your table, but go forth and domesticate this and tell your son to do that too and perhaps in 300 generations we'll have food. I think the early humans were too concerned with, uh, with living day to day of hunting and gathering food that was already available than to try to domesticate any kind of crop. And notice there have been no other major crops domesticated since then. We still eat wheat, barley, oats, emer, corn without much change, some hybridization, certainly. But we have the advantage today of having genetic knowledge, just like the Anunnaki did. The Sumerians said that, uh, that uh, agriculture and all the crops that came with it were gifts of the gods. I believe them. I don't believe we could have possibly domesticated these crops. Same way with animals. Um, we're told that uh, the, the cattle is domesticated from this wild thing called an auroch. This is a, a depiction of an auroch in the Lascaux Cave, and this is what they think it might have looked like. A human would have come up to about the tail. I don't think we had a chance of do domesticating this. I think we... <laughs> I wouldn't attempt it. 
I would hunt this thing with a 308, but I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't try to bring it into my home and try to domesticate it. I think that any domestication that happened happened at the genetic level. I think it happened in the garden of the of Aden, the that but botanical research place in Mesopotamia. And I think we were given cattle, goats, pigs, and all these other created uh, animals and uh, crops to tend for the Anunnaki and subsequently for ourselves. Well, any one of these you might be able to dismiss, but if you take them all together. I think you at least have to, when you're weighing that with the conventional knowledge, have to say this theory of human development has some merit. At least I'm going to remain an open-minded skeptic, and I hope you will remain an open-minded skeptic too. Uh, two books to read, Zechariah Sitchin's The Twelfth Planet and Lloyd Pye's Everything You Know is Wrong. Great book. Will Hart also, uh, Genesis Race. Uh, I won't go into this a great deal. I sort of need to move on. Yes. Um, there, here's a picture of uh, in key depicted off of the cylinder seal on the bottom, shown as a serpent again, and not because of he had any, any evil intent, because he was regarded as a very wise, he was a scientist, and he knew how things worked. He was a geneticist. He was a metallurgist. He gave us metallurgy. He gave us... Uh, uh, astronomy, mathematics, the written language. I uh, suspect also he gave us written music. And I'm grateful to him because I'm a musician, among other things. Have you ever wondered why we humans alone do music? I sit there sometimes playing the band I play with and go, why do I do music? Why do I enjoy music so much? None of the other primates do music. I think that's one of the gifts of the Anunnaki. Who were they? They were very robust physically. As you saw on the other cylinder seals, the, the males stood 10 to 12 feet tall. Actually, I think some of them may have been as tall as 15 feet. The females could range up to about 9 or 10 feet tall. Uh, what were they like? Well, some people say they look like us. Uh, I've turned that around. No, we look like them. And uh, we share a uh, common genetic um, uh, code because of the, the brush that Tiamat and its satellite had with Earth many years ago. But more lately, I've come to realize that the hominid shape, us, head, two arms, two legs, standing upright, is, uh, appears to be a, a universal shape. Uh, all of the uh, sightings and abductions that we hear talk of are with hominids, homi uh, the hominid shape. I'm beginning to think that the, the uh, human shape is a universal and it makes sense because it's very efficient. We can walk around and handle things and pick things up. Um, moving on. Uh, the things that we refer to as their temples, the Sumerian temples, the Egyptian temples, I think were actually their living places. And they abandoned them. And we, uh, at, when they abandoned them, um, we, we turned them into uh, places to be revered. And that's why they became temples. I think that was the point when we invented religion. We went from working for the gods to worshiping the gods. I don't want to offend anybody's religion. I've had some of my fair share of it myself, but uh, I think that's where religion originated. When the gods were no longer in our lives, we had to have something to look up to, so we began worshiping, and that's where we get the concept of worship to this day. That's my take. And uh, when the sons of the Anunnaki, uh, and this is mirrored in the Hebrew account, uh, saw the little humans that they had created, they saw some of the females and liked what they saw. And uh, uh, they began intermarrying with them. And the upper echelon, the, the, uh, the higher ranks of Anunnaki did not like what they saw. So, and this is not according to me or Zechariah Sitchin. This is right in the Enuma Elish. You can go read that. And the same thing, if you see, it came into Genesis in the chapter 6, I believe, where it talks about there were giants in those days. And uh, the gods, the Nephilim, did not like that their sons were intermarrying with this little being. Well, that story goes back to the Sumerian account. So... Um, the upper echelon, Enlil and others said, we need to put an end to this experiment. Their time on Earth was drawing at a close anyway. 
and they knew something. They knew that Earth was about to be flooded. Uh, they knew that there were some natural disasters about to happen, and they thought, well, we'll just leave the planet and leave this creature to its own devices. They've outlived their usefulness. We no longer need them. We'll let them perish in this coming flood. Nibiru was due for another pass through anyway, and they were getting ready to go off planet. And uh, there were billions of tons, just like there is now, by the way. There's a two-mile uh, thick ice pack on the southern, on the Antarctic region. Uh, then, at that time, uh, near the end of the last ice age, that was three miles thick. Much of the world's water supply was caught up in, in ice at the South Pole. So they thought that the gravitational forces caused by the passage of Nibiru would cause earthquakes and might shake loose that ice pack, flooding the world. So they decided they were going to leave and leave us to perish. The time was about uh, 10,500 BC, and uh, with billions of tons on the, uh, on the Antarctic, this is probably about what it looked like. If you could get a cross section, uh, of, uh, of the uh, Antarctica region. That's, and you notice there's a, uh, a shelf, and there is a shelf today. It's very small. Don't worry, we're not going to be flooded anytime soon. But this may happen again in, in our distant future as more and more ice builds up on the ice pack. Millions of cubic miles of, uh, of, of uh, ice just ready to drop in. Have you ever dropped an ice cube into a glass and had it splash on your floor? The tsunami that happened last year in, in uh, the Pacific was nothing compared with what would happen, and that's exactly what happened. The ice pack, once it crashed into the sea, would send water flooding northward, and that's why we have so many accounts of floods throughout the world. China, South America, North America, uh, certainly the, the Middle East because I think a flood actually did happen. Our, our ancestors, ancestors did not hallucinate. They wrote down what they saw, and the, there's a very traumatic flood in our past. It might have looked something like that as the ice crashed into the sea, sending huge walls of water. Enlil had sworn everybody to secrecy. Uh, he's the God I love to hate. <laughs> Uh, he wanted to do away with us. But in key, he is the one who created us. He had de developed an, an affection for us. And he took his favorite, who according to the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh was Ziasudra, and said, I don't want my, my creation to perish. I want you to build a boat, a submersible boat, take on it and he didn't take two by two animals like the, the Hebrew account shows. He took grain. He took genetic material. He said, take this on board and uh, survive. Take your family. And that's precisely what happened. He built some kind of a submersible craft. And when the order was given, the, the gods lifted off. And this is, an, again, not according to me. This is according to the Enuma Elish and the Atrahasis and the Gilgamesh epic and the floodwaters hit. The gods watched from outer space, uh, and there are accounts of what they saw. There was weeping and wailing as they saw their former homes awash and flooded under my, uh, several meters of mud, and all of the, the humans uh, killed off. After the floodwaters subsided, they came back and found that there were still a remnant. In fact, the Zia Sudra had survived. And farther inland, there were other uh, small settlements of humans that had survived, living in these uh, cave-like conditions. The excess humans, those who weren't useful in the fields, those who weren't useful in, to serve and work for the gods, who were, couldn't live in the villages for one reason or another, just for overpopulation, were sent out, were thrown out of Eden, as it were. <clears throat> in fact, that's where that story came from. To being expelled from Eden or it came from uh, the excess pop uh, surplus population of humans were sent out to, to live on their own devices. Well, these humans living in those conditions were, uh, were the, the Anunnaki took pity on them. 
And they thought, we're not ready to abandon Earth just yet, for it. so as long as we're going to live here, even for another few thousand years, we need the help of the humans. So they gave us the rudiments of civilization and set us on that path of civilization so that we had agriculture, we had metallurgy, we had a written language that we could pass stuff on. In fact, some of the early surviving clay tablets are textbooks, how to do things, how to make beer, too. And then, shortly after that, we had a full civilization that really shouldn't be here. The only reason that we are here is because the Anunnaki gave us these things. This is uh, Tikulti Ninurta. <clears throat> he served a god called Nin Nisku. And about 12, this is him in 1210, in uh, happy times. In 1208 BC, just a few years later, this is another, another depiction of him <clears throat> kneeling before an empty throne. Excuse me. <clears throat> and the inscription that goes along with this says, What will I do when my master has gone away? What will I tell the people? The God he served that he worked for <clears throat> had gone. In fact, about this time, all the gods were departing earth. They had uh, all they needed from us, and it was time to go. So they left and left us on our own devices. I think from that point, we created religion and all the forms that we have today, whether you think they're functional or dysfunctional, we are stuck with them. The, uh, the church, the governments we have, uh, stem from that time. <clears throat> Approach with caution. Humans live here. I heard the other day we just surpassed six and a half billion people. I think we crowded them off. Uh, there, there were just too many of us. And, but they didn't leave entirely. I think they're still watching us. In fact, one of the terms for the, these beings throughout history has been watchers. In Sumerian, it was called igigi. In the Hebrew, it uh, actually refers to some watchers. I don't have to tell you this room, I have to really convince people out there that there are UFOs. But the, here's some, I'll just real quickly go through them. This is uh, in England. Here's one taken in Rhode Island just a few years ago. Here's one in Ohio over a farm. Uh, this is taken, that picture was taken by our Mars rover in the skies of Mars. This is a drawing by a Soviet cosmonaut, said he saw this while he was in space. And this is the last picture taken by the uh, Phobos uh, satellite sent by the Russians before it was thrown out of control. Something was there that shouldn't have been there. And make of this what you will. I've heard some people say, oh, that's just a fake. And this is from Mexico. And I've heard other people say, no, this is some of the best footage we've got of a UFO. I personally think this is an uncloaked uh, beam ship. Watch as he goes behind that building. If that's a fake, that's a damn good fake. I think it's real. That's rare footage. This is where I work. Uh, I, I work uh, in Oak Ridge, very near the, uh, the Y-12 weapons complex. If anybody knows anything about nuclear energy and nuclear weaponry, Y-12 is the place where they keep all the really hot stuff. It's the most secure place probably in this country. Nothing gets in or out of there unless you are escorted or badged to go in it. And there's a no-fly zone. Nothing flies over it without permission. We were taking a picture of uh, one of our dump trucks uh, dumping at a waste site. And I happened to, I get to review a lot of pictures. And I saw this. And I saw something up in the sky. I don't know if you can see it at that magnification. And in that direction, just four miles down the road, is the Y-12 weapons complex. I blew it up there a little bit. That's something over Y-12 that shouldn't be there. And if you look on Google, do a search for Y-12 or the Manhattan Project or Oak Ridge and UFOs, you're going to get a lot of hits because there have been a lot of hits, uh, a lot of uh, 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 sightings over nuclear uh, facilities. In fact, if you know the story about Minot Air Force Base and Malmstrom Air Force Base, there was an incident where UFOs appeared and then they shut down our entire nuclear capability at those sites. We, we, those missiles were offline. They, they took our missiles offline, as if to say, be careful. We can do this to you. 
So the upper picture is uh, from the Cassini space probe, that's Saturn down below and something in the sky that nobody wants to talk about. And I believe that's a Billy Myers picture in the lower, I'm not real sure. This is Haleakala a astronomy uh, telescope. And something in that rotation was seen in the skies that the astronomers said, we don't know what that was. It was very near Earth, too. I don't need to tell you that we're being watched, and have been for a long time, probably thousands of years. This is the classic case of the, the gray. Uh, I think this is what the uh, Sumerians were referring to when they talked about igigi, or when the Hebrew Bible talks about uh, the emissaries. I think they're talking about this being right here. And it's been around from, for many ages. This is a, from a wall of, uh, in uh, Egypt. I don't know if you can see that out there. It's at Saqqara. I think that's a gray being depicted right there. What are they watching? They're watching our behavior. <clears throat> when they created us, we got the good attributes along with the bad. Um, our history is full of, of uh, religious wars, ancient religious wars, modern religious wars, Rights of all kinds. We, we have a pretty healthy criminal class. But we also have some, some of the good. We have brilliant people who are born and people who have traits of altruism. We do art and we do music, as I said before. These are the good things we got. We have to learn how to balance this. And, and, and as I've, as I've, uh, the, the, uh, what the, um, watchers are really watching and has been become more intense since 1945 is our, our use of nuclear weapons and I think that's why the, they've warned us about the use of nuclear weapons. I think someday in the very near future probably in my lifetime in your lifetime most people in this room we're going to come face to face with them again. I think we're going to meet them sometime early this century to the mid-century. I hope I'm around to see it. But I wonder what that's going ha to cause happen with uh, our basic forms, uh, our, like our government. And I'm not just talking about Washington, D.C. either. I'm talking about all governments. What will that do to the basic uh, institution of religion, and not just the Vatican, but all religions? What, what would that do to, say, Islam? What would that knowledge do to Hindus, I have no idea, but we should be thinking about that. What would it do to our basic financial institutions? Where would, where would my 401k go <laughs> if suddenly uh, a saucer landed on the White House lawn? I have no idea. But more than, than those uh, basic institutions, just our every day-to-day -day life, we would suddenly be confronted with the fact that we are not alone in the universe and never have been. This little jewel we live on uh, is very precious. And uh, I think they're telling us, take better care of it. I know if, if the UFO sat down outside on the, on the street today, people in this room would be much more accepting of it. But how is it going to affect the rest of humanity? And I'm just gonna leave you with that thought. I, ha I can't answer that question. And that's why I'm glad to see the, these uh, conferences uh, happen. This is certainly not the end. I think the story has yet to be written. And uh, I thank you all very much for having me here.